Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for uh, being here and for very important and powerful testimony. I'll start with Mr. DePulford. Uh, in your view, is the government of China deliberately pursuing a strategy to dominate the electric vehicle supply chain and undermine our strategic industries, uh, or is it proceeding in this direction sort of um, by happenstance? Uh, thank you, Mr. Jenis. It, yes, is the short answer. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can listen to the uh, words of the man himself. So in a speech delivered at the seventh session of the Communist Party's Finance and Economic Committee in April 2020, Xi Jinping said, China will aim to form a counterattack and deterrence against other countries by fostering killer technologies and strengthening the global supply chain's dependence on China. And that is a, a very literal translation, Mr. Jenner. So you can see quite clearly this is an explicitly stated strategy of the Chinese Communist Party. Why governments around the world continue to sleepwalk into it uh, is a question which is completely beyond me. Uh, Mr. DePulford, I, I think that's a very powerful quote uh, because you're, you're bringing us the words of Xi Jinping explicitly framing uh, the effort to dominate the electric vehicle supply chain in military terms, counterattack, deterrence. Uh, he, is, uh, he, he is pursuing a policy, it seems, aimed at dominating and controlling these industries as part of what he perceives to be a competition, a, a competition uh, with, with us. So our, our response, presumably, uh, it has to be uh, to take steps to not be dependent uh, on, uh, on, on the Chinese economy for, for these critical industries, to allow ourselves to have other sources, other alternatives uh, that don't involve uh, the potential for this kind of counterattack and, and deterrence. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. And unfortunately, I fear that in some industries, um, it might be a little bit too late. I mean, certainly when it comes to processing of rare earth materials, for example, uh, China's processing capacity so dominates uh, the global ability uh, to process these kinds of materials that uh, it's pretty difficult to know how else and where else we can get it done. Similarly, in renewable energy, or even for the production and processing of lithium and lithium batteries, uh, so many different areas related to the renewable industry alone have become totally dominated by China as a part of this explicit strategy. Uh, but yes, auditing and reducing uh, dependency as a matter of urgency is something we all ought to be doing. Uh, thank you very much. I want to ask you about the ESG movement, uh, and I'll, I'll make a statement and invite your, your comment on it. Uh, the, the too often the ESG movement has um, ha has has led to uh, a kind of exclusive focus on the E uh, and ignoring uh, social and governance consequences as well as strategic consequences uh, for certain decisions. And the push for a green transition has been accompanied by certain decision makers turning a, a blind eye to the human implications, uh, to the way that uh, sor sourcing of these materials uh, has led to slave labor and deplorable conditions uh, in, um, in, for instance, uh, mines in the DRC. Uh, and uh, I know you've done a great deal of work on the Uyghur genocide, which is, which is part of this as well. Um, do, do you agree that this is a problem and... Um, and is it is it critically important that we um, we hold gr green industries uh, to to strong human rights standards and not allow uh, a blind eye to be turned to human rights in the name of uh, of a of a aspired for green transition? Uh, thank you for the question. Well, I think without naming any specific companies and uh, potentially abusing parliamentary privilege in the process, um, it has been a surprise to me. Uh, just how many companies have been happy uh, to burnish their credentials around uh, the S and the G while continuing to source shamelessly uh, from places that are known uh, to be riven with Uyghur forced labor. Let me give you a couple of examples. All four 
of the Uyghur region's polysilic man manufacturers are strongly implicated in the forced labor of Uyghurs, all four of them. And that accounts for about 40% of the global supply of poly polysilicon, without which it isn't possible to make solar panels. Uh, key actors in the lithium processing and distribution supply chain, uh, they are very strongly connected to uh, forced uh, labor transfer schemes. You know, these schemes, government sponsored schemes, where people mainly from ethnic minorities are effectively dumped in companies. Um, and where they have to work against their will. We know this from Chinese government data, and it's demonstrated very credibly in the literature now why it is that these companies seem to be able to hold their noses uh, where there's such a clear connection uh, to forced labor uh, is, is rather baffling. So I tend to agree with your analysis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. DePulford, um... You spoke in response to my colleague's question about the differences between uh, the American government's relative success stopping products made from forced labor from coming into the United States and Canada's uh, catastrophic failure at preventing products uh, involving forced labor from coming, coming into our country. You, you mentioned legislative differences between Canada and the United States, and you also mentioned potential issues of capacity. It has always seemed to me, though, that we can address the capacity challenges by having effective alignment among democracies. Of course, you understand that it's difficult to, to trace origins, that, that, that uh, digging into supply chains can be, can be complex. Uh, but if we collaborated more effectively with like-minded allies so that we could be sharing information, uh, then we would ease any capacity pressures and we would ensure that we would be succeeding at the level uh, of our uh, of our allies, I would like to see a situation where if a shipment is turned away from Seattle because it has products uh, in, made from forced labor, it can't simply go and dock in in Vancouver. That we're benefiting from uh, American experience uh, and know how, and really the the bipartisan work that's been done there. I also wonder if this kind of framework for collaboration. Uh, could be extended to more allies if we could establish some kind of partnership involving uh, our North American economies, but also uh, Japan, the UK, uh, Europe, etc. Uh, what do you think about the possibility of establishing some kind of uh, effective alignment on uh, on preventing products made from forced labor from coming into our economies and sharing information in the process? Thank you for the question. I think it would be long overdue, but the complexity of the task shouldn't be understated. Um, for example, in any phone, you will have literally hundreds, possibly even thousands of sourcing inputs. And for each of those sourcing inputs, you will have a different supply chain or a slightly diverse supply chain. And trying to map out exactly where every single piece of that thing comes from is an extraordinarily complex thing. But companies know how to do it, because otherwise, where do they get those things? So it is them very possible. Yeah. Sorry, I, just I, if I could just j jump in quickly on the, on the complexity piece. I mean, I guess my point would be, if the Americans are doing it, uh, can we not simply um, make better use of the information they're already gathering, though? It's complicated for someone to do it, but it would seem less complicated uh, to have multiple countries benefiting from the same information than to have everyone doing that work themselves, right? Thank you very much. Well, I think the, the point I was making is that um, if the, the, the what's so revolutionary about the Uyghur Forced Labour Prevention Act is it provides that every single thing that you cannot import anything from there. It's not just a, a whole phone. It's the bits. It's its constituent parts. And that makes a big difference. But I was coming to to address your point. Um, the complexity is not a reason not to do it. And we do have some interesting new tools. For example, with organic materials, uh, there are companies like Oritain. Oritain isn't the only company, but there are companies like Oritain who have isotopic maps of various parts of the world with, with technology so sensitive that they can take a hair on your head and tell you where you've been over the past six months. So any organic material they can test and they can tell you whether or not it comes from Xinjiang. So we don't need to be doing this all-encompassing thing here. We can spot check companies and some companies uh, do have contracts with Oritain and, and other similar organizations. So there are ways around this. I don't, I don't believe in it, the capacity argument. It's a question of political will, but we do have to have the legislative tools. And at the moment, I believe that really only the US does when it comes to Uyghur forced labor. Okay,